the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Who are they and what do they represent? For thousands of years, these four horsemen have been shrouded in mystery, fear, and intrigue. In this video, we use the Bible and historical records to unveil the mystery of these four horsemen. A correct understanding of these four horsemen of the apocalypse provides a powerful key to understanding the book of Revelation and being prepared for the soon return of the Messiah. A popular teaching is that these horsemen are angels bringing judgments from God. But what does the Bible teach? In the book of Revelation, angels are described as literal beings, not as symbols. These horsemen are not angels, but symbolic representations of events in history. These events are important for us to know because they set the stage for what we are seeing today in the Christian church. Let's unravel it now. What do horses represent in the Bible? Horses represent warfare. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is depicted as riding a horse to battle against the enemies of God. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Here we can see the horse used as a symbol of warfare. In the Bible times, the horse was central to military operations. So it's easy to see why the Bible writers use horses to represent warfare. So if the horses represent warfare, what are the riders doing? They are engaging in some form of combat. But before we can understand what these riders are doing, we need to know the starting point when the first rider appears. The previous chapter, Revelation chapter 5, depicts Christ as an overcomer against the powers of evil. He has come to this earth as a man, lived and died and paid the ransom for sin. Because of this, he is able to open the sealed book and reveal the future. The very next scene is the four horsemen. So following this chronology, we should expect these scenes to start with the early Christian church, which began after Christ ascended back to heaven. Keep this in mind as we continue to unravel this mystery. Horseman 1, the white horse. Now I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I looked, and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The first horse is a white horse, Colors in the Bible have meaning. White represents purity. White is used in the Bible to represent purity. It is the opposite to sin. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Was the early church that Christ started pure? Yes, it was. And could that early church be described as militant in its evangelism? Yes, indeed. In fact, the gospel went to the then known world in just a few years. The gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven. The rest of the imagery fits this interpretation. The writer had a bow, which is a fitting illustration of how the truth of God's word hit home to many hearts. When Peter delivered his first sermon after the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles, the Bible records, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? This is just one example of the arrows of truth coming from the bow of the first horseman. Revelation also says that the rider was given a crown. This is not a kingly crown, but a victory wreath, given to someone who has won a battle or event. It goes on to say, And he went out conquering and to conquer. What an apt description of the missionary labors of the early church. But the scene quickly changes as the next horseman appears. First, if you are new to the channel, please consider subscribing. Also, I noticed that only 32.4% of you have selected all bell notifications. Make sure to select this and turn on YouTube notifications to be notified of all my new videos. Now for the second horseman. Horseman 2, the red horse. When he opened the second seal, another horse, fiery red, went out and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Some have thought that taking peace from the earth 
was due to the work of the gospel being preached. But notice that the result of the work of the red horse is that people should kill one another. In other words, this horseman causes disunity and discord in the church, which results in bloodshed. This is not the work of the gospel. The color of this horse is red, which as we saw earlier in Isaiah 1.18, is the color of sin. If the church was pure in the white horse, then the red horse that follows indicates the church has fallen into apostasy. The Apostle Paul saw these errors coming in during his lifetime, and he warned the church, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. For I know this, that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Little by little, errors began to creep in. Christians began to unite with pagans and compromise their faith. Everything came to a head with the alleged conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine to Christianity. As Constantine went out to fight the Battle of Milvian Bridge, he said he saw with his own eyes up in the sky and resting over the sun a cross-shaped trophy formed from light and a text attached to it which said, By this, conquer. According to Constantine, he was directed to paint this emblem on the shields of his soldiers. This he did and won the Battle of Milvian Bridge, giving him control of the Western Empire of Rome. After this victory, in February 313 AD, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan. This edict gave Christians the freedom to worship as they chose without persecution. All property and churches that had been confiscated were to be restored. Not only that, but Constantine himself publicly announced his conversion and made Christianity the state religion. Up until this time, the Roman Empire had bitterly persecuted Christianity. Now, just overnight, Christianity was elevated from the dungeon to the throne. Christians were given wealth and positions of influence. As a result, thousands became Christians for money rather than love for Christ. But this sudden elevation of Christianity resulted in its downfall. This happened chiefly in two ways. First, in order to unite Christians and pagans, Constantine tried to Christianize pagan idols and festivals. Most notably was his elevation of Sunday as a day of rest and worship. The historian Edward Gibbon notes, Constantine styles the Lord's Day, Dies Solis, a name which could not offend the ears of his pagan subjects. This was the start of Sunday worship in the Christian church. For information on how this change came about, watch my video, Who Changed the Sabbath? This watering down of Christianity caused it to lose its original purity. The church was going from white to red. Secondly, once the church got hold of political power, it began to use the civil sword to punish and silence dissenters. Notice that the Bible says the rider of the red horse was given a great sword. The sword in the Bible represents civil power and authority. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for he does not bear the sword in vain. This civil sword was given to the church by Constantine. Notice what the historian writes. The Edict of Milan, the great charter of toleration, had confirmed to each individual of the Roman world the privilege of choosing and professing his own religion. But this inestimable privilege was soon violated. With the knowledge of truth, the emperor imbibed the maxims of persecution, and the sects which dissented from the Catholic Church were afflicted and oppressed by the triumph of Christianity. The abuse of Christianity introduced into the Roman government new causes of tyranny and sedition, the bands of civil society were torn asunder by the fury of religious factions. Thus, peace was indeed taken from the earth, and people killed each other, just as the Bible predicted. But this was just the beginning. From here the church was to plunge to the depths of corruption unimaginable. Horseman 3, the Black Horse. When he opened the third seal, I looked and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, 
and do not harm the oil and the wine. Black is the opposite of white and represents darkness and error. This is a very fitting color for the next phase of the Christian church. The historian Johann Mosheim tells us that the pagan philosophy which was so rampant before Christianity took the throne was now confirmed, enlarged, and established in various ways. Hence arose that extravagant veneration for departed saints and those absurd notions of a certain fire destined to purify separate souls, also the celibacy of priests, the worship of images and relics, which in process of time almost utterly destroyed the Christian religion, or at least eclipsed its luster, and corrupted its very essence in the most deplorable manner. An enormous train of superstitions was gradually substituted for true religion and genuine piety. These pagan ideas and styles of worship were gradually brought into the church. Soon, Christians were worshiping idols just like the pagans, and even honoring the pagan day of the sun. Not only that, but the possibility of obtaining salvation through works and penance was very attractive to the unconverted heart. The people were taught that they had to torture their bodies to get rid of sin and to appease an angry God. More errors, such as the teaching of the horrors of hellfire, an eternal place of torment, was vividly portrayed before the people. A cloud of darkness and superstition settled upon the church. John saw the rider of the black horse holding a pair of balances. Balances and scales in the Bible are a symbol of commerce and trade. Israel is a merchant. The balances of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. This is a fitting description of the 4th century Christian church, now known as the Roman Catholic Church. The church began to commercialize religion. Forgiveness of sins was sold for money. One could even pay to have their dead loved ones released from the fires of purgatory. Rich streams of money flowed into the church's treasury. She became the richest organization in the world. John then hears a voice from the beings around the throne of God, which said, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. These are famine prices. A denarius was a day's wage for the average laborer. These prices are approximately ten times the usual price. Under the iron rule of the papacy, the word of God was chained to the convent walls and locked away in an unfamiliar tongue. Only the priest was allowed to interpret the Bible to the people. The result was a famine of truth and the word of God. Without the guiding light of truth, the people were at the mercy of superstitions and the fables of the priests. And then there is a glimmer of hope amidst the darkness. The mysterious voice continued, And do not harm the oil and the wine. Oil in the Bible represents the Holy Spirit. In Zechariah chapter 4, the prophet is presented with a vision of oil flowing from olive trees to a lampstand. The angel then tells the prophet, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Wine represents doctrine and teachings. Unfermented wine, or grape juice, is represented by the truth of God. Ho, everyone who thirst, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, incline your ear, and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live. Fermented wine represents false doctrine and teachings. Speaking of Babylon the Great, the Bible says, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. As the third horseman is going forth, the call is made from heaven, don't hurt the oil and the wine. This, without doubt, is a reference to the truth of God, which, though oppressed, was not wholly destroyed. Through the darkest night of papal rule, the true Church of Christ remained. The Bible says, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. The woman spoken of here represents the true church of God, 
This is in contrast with the mainstream church mentioned in Revelation 17 as a harlot or a woman who was unfaithful to her husband, which in this case is God. The true church is made up of those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The mainstream church had accepted man's traditions over the commandments of God and had corrupted the truth of God's word in the minds of the people. But there was a remnant who upheld Bible truth. This remnant was bitterly persecuted by the established church. One Christian writer recalls, Amid the gloom that settled upon the earth during the long period of papal supremacy, the light of truth could not be wholly extinguished. In every age there were witnesses for God, men who cherished faith in Christ as the only mediator between God and man, who held the Bible as the only rule of life, and who hallowed the true Sabbath. How much the world owes to these men, posterity will never know. They were branded as heretics, their motives impugned, their characters maligned, their writings suppressed, misrepresented, or mutilated. Yet they stood firm, and from age to age maintained their faith in its purity as a sacred heritage for the generations to come. One of these groups who upheld the truth amid the darkness was the Waldenses. They were not deceived by the errors of Rome because they had the Bible in their native language. This guiding light enabled them to stay true to God. Forced to flee for their lives to escape persecution, they built their homes and churches in the secluded and inaccessible Italian Alps. Here they were able to worship God according to their conscience. They refused to accept the dogma of the church that said that people must come to God through saints and priests. They believed in the only true mediator between God and man, which is Jesus Christ. They kept the Bible Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week, instead of the Papal Sunday. From their secluded mountain homes, they sent their missionaries down to the cities below. Disguised as merchants, they sold goods to the people, but hidden in their garments were priceless gems of truth, portions of precious scripture, which they distributed to the souls who were hungry for the truth. These missionaries were a constant thorn in the side of the Roman church, and whenever they were caught, they were put to death in the most cruel manner possible. Yet their dying testimony spoke loudly to the truth of their cause. The Black Horseman of the Apocalypse is a fitting symbol for the rise of the Papal Church to power. But the worst was yet to come. Horseman 4, the Pale Horse. When he opened the fourth seal, I looked and behold a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. The last horseman is truly a frightening spectacle. This horse is the color of death, and the rider's name is death. Hades, which means the grave, followed after. This is a picture of widespread spiritual, intellectual, and physical death. The last horseman is a vivid picture of the rule of the papacy at the height of its power. From the year 538 AD to 1798, the Roman Catholic Church held absolute control of all of Europe. But as the historian Dr. James Wiley puts it, the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. If you were to describe the rule of the Catholic Church in one word, it would be death. It was spiritual death due to the word of God being hidden from the people. It was physical death to her dissenters. It is estimated that over 50 million people were murdered by the papacy during her dominance. And in many cases, they were killed using the most cruel and barbaric ways possible. This was the era of the Inquisition, an institution of the papacy designed to combat and punish heretics. Tortures too horrific to describe were inflicted on heretics. It was also intellectual death as the advancement of science, culture, and art were halted. And with the great detector of right and wrong removed, people just sunk deeper and deeper into sin. One historical commentator wrote, Like the Pharisees of old, the papal leaders hated the light which would reveal their sins. God's law, the standard of righteousness, having been removed, they exercised power without limits and practiced vice without restraint. Fraud, avarice, and profligacy or extravagance prevailed. 
Men shrank from no crime by which they could gain wealth or position. The palaces of popes and prelates were scenes of the vilest debauchery, sex, alcohol, etc. Some of the reigning pontiffs were guilty of crimes so revolting that secular rulers endeavored to depose these dignitaries of the church as monsters too vile to be tolerated. For centuries, Europe had made no progress in learning, arts, or civilization. A moral and intellectual paralysis had fallen upon Christendom. Friends, this is what happens when God's law is put aside for the traditions of men. The Bible goes on to give us some more details about this era of the pale horse. And power was given to them, death in Hades, over a fourth of the earth. The papal church's influence extended over approximately one quarter of the then known world. And power was given to them to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the earth. These words describe the ways which this power was to rule the earth. The sword represents civil power. Hunger represents control of the food and basic essentials. The papal church also used fear of death to compel people to obey. And beast of the earth also refers to death and destruction. In the Bible, often when someone was preparing to kill someone, they would threaten to give their flesh to the beast of the earth. The pale horse represents the peak of the Dark Ages, when the Roman Catholic Church ruled supreme. Some may ask, why does God allow such a power to so ruthlessly persecute His people? If God knew about these events, and even predicted them in the Bible, why doesn't He stop it? The answer is, He will stop it. And Revelation tells us exactly how He will put a stop to this power. But God also has to allow evil to run its course. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Unfortunately, evil has taken deep root in the hearts of humanity, and God is waiting as long as He can, so that He can save as many people as He can before He fully deals with evil. But He won't wait forever. God has an appointed time when He will declare, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. God has not revealed to us when this will happen. But He has given us signs telling us when it is near, and has commanded us to be ready for it. The book of Revelation shows us that God has not been caught off guard by the powers of evil. He has predicted these events before they happened, so we can have confidence that He is in charge. These four horsemen that we have learned about are part of a sequence of seals which God opened and revealed to the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 5. The four horsemen are the first four seals. The rest of the seals reveal God's dealing with evil and how He will triumph in the end. Then, near the end of the book of Revelation, we find another horseman, and it is at this moment that our story takes an unexpected and spectacular turn. But first, let's quickly reveal what happens after the four horsemen where we left off. In Revelation chapter 7, which follows the four horsemen, God tells us who will be sealed and saved in His kingdom. This is in contrast to the false kingdom of darkness that we have seen in the last three horsemen. Chapters 8 and 9 reveal the judgments of God against evil throughout the centuries through seven trumpets. In chapters 10 through 12, using symbols like a scroll, a measuring stick, the two witnesses, a pregnant woman and a dragon, God illustrates how His true church will triumph over the kingdom of Satan. Then, in Revelation chapters 13 through 15, we see Satan's final game plan revealed and God's response to it. Revelation chapter 17 and 18 showcases Babylon the Great in the form of a harlot woman and how she will be judged. Then finally in chapter 19, we witness that spectacular turn of events, the arrival of a fifth horseman, Jesus Christ, the hero of Revelation, breaking through the sky with all his army of heavenly hosts to engage in warfare against Satan and his angels. Now I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, 
and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and in his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, steps in to deliver his people in this triumphant victory. This is the outcome of the great battle of Armageddon, spoken of in Revelation chapter 16. For information on this great battle of Armageddon, watch my video, Armageddon. God has a true church that will stand to the end. The Bible describes this church in Revelation chapter 14. After giving the final warnings against receiving the mark of the beast, God says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The word patience in this verse is better translated steadfast endurance. The true church of God is steadfast to the word of God, despite the pressures and deceptions of the forces of evil. They keep the commandments of God, and they have the faith of Jesus. Friends, it is Jesus' faith that you need to stand true for God, no matter what the devil attacks you with. It is Jesus' faith that will enable you to keep the commandments of God, even under intense pressure. Think about what Christ went through on the cross. Even though all the forces of evil threw everything they possibly could at him, he stood firm, and he offers that same faith and strength to you. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are a solemn warning to each of us. The Christian church started out pure. They kept the commandments of God. They had the faith of Jesus. They stood firm in the face of persecution and death. But when persecution stopped and their life became easy, many lost their faith and followed the ways of the world. What about you, friend? In these times of relative peace and prosperity, are you staying true to God's word? If there is anything in your life that will give the devil a foothold, get rid of it. Now is the time to prepare for the final conflict, which is soon to break over all the earth. Remember, the true church of God is steadfast to the word no matter what. There are so many different churches today because they didn't stay true to God's word. They may have started out with the truth, but they didn't continue in the truth as God revealed more light. Once you compromise on one point, you have started on the path that leads down to total apostasy. But friends, the good news is, you don't have to be deceived. You can be steadfast to the truth. Here are four simple steps to staying true to the Word of God. Have the faith of Jesus. The truth won't do you any good unless you are connected to Jesus. He offers you His faith, which will give you the courage to walk in the truth that He reveals to you. Make sure you are daily connecting with Jesus in prayer and Bible study. The more you focus on Christ and His beautiful life, the more you will become like Him. Read the four Gospels, especially the scenes of His trial and death. Thus, Jesus' faith can become your faith. Know the truth. You can't stay true to God unless you know what the truth is. God has revealed the truth in His Word. You can find resources to help you find the truth in the links in the description below. Find a church that teaches the truth. It's important to fellowship at a church that teaches the truth of God's Word. There are so many popular churches that don't follow the Bible fully. Click the link in the description to get connected with a church like this in your area. Share the truth. Once you find the truth, you need to share it. Sharing the truth strengthens your faith and helps to forward God's kingdom thus hastening His coming. Sharing videos like this one on social media is just one simple way that you can start. Add a personal note to your social media post, telling your friends how this video has impacted you. And so, my friend, now is the time to choose. Will you be steadfast to the truth, regardless of the pressure that you may experience from friends and family? Will you join God's true church, who follows the Bible fully, keeping all ten of the commandments of God. If this is your desire, write in the comments below 
Lord, I want to be steadfast to your word. Amen. Praise God for your decision, friend. If you have found this video helpful, please like it and share it with your friends and family. Make sure you are subscribed to this channel so you can get more truth-filled videos to help you on your journey. And don't miss this powerful video, an eye-opening look at the Battle of Armageddon. But most of all, friends, keep your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith.